where did these stories come from? And so the Bible gave an answer. And the Bible's answer was the Tower of Babel. And this story, just to refresh people's memory, is that people wanted to behold God's glory so closely that they organized together and they collaborated to build the tallest tower that can be imagined. And in the story, God got upset and so destroyed the tower, separated all the people, and created different languages so they could no longer easily communicate or collaborate with each other. And so this was the story as it stood for thousands of years until, oh, well, my thing won't let me tell you what comes next, all right, the anticipation, until slightly before Grimm's fairy tales. I'll get into it because it's such an interesting story. But so, so this is the, the beginning of the story of how we know what we know. So first, people before, uh, before Sir William Jones had realized that, you know, there were commonalities across languages, a lot of similar words, maybe similar grammars, some similarities across languages that couldn't be easily explained. William Jones uh, was in Britain, and he went to India to take an assignment there. It was, it was a, a colony of India, of uh, UK at the time. And he realized that not only were there similarities across the Romance languages, so Spanish, French, etc., but also he realized Sanskrit itself had very common similarities. So he created this idea of Indo-European languages, that there was a source language that, um, that these other things came from, that, these, that there was an earlier culture with an earlier language, and these languages all came from that. And he and others around that time and, and, and over time realized three important things. So this is 1786. They realized three important things. Here are some interesting aspects about words. One, they make copies. And so other ways of talking about it are the word spreads. Uh, they have, things have children. They maybe not words themselves, but they reproduce, they replicate, they make copies of themselves. All of these ideas are, rep, are, are part of what a word is because you might hear a word from either your parents or a friend or uh, when you travel. And so you hear words and then the word comes from the person you heard it from into yourself. And so it, it replicates. The second is that it varies. And so over time, there are different dialects, different pronunciations of it. Um, and so copies aren't clones. They're mostly clones, but there's some slight changes over time. And these are mutations, they're vary, or you might call, say that they're different over time. Um, and then there's also this third idea, and that's selection. The first two are easy to see, that something makes copies or it varies, or, and then it varies over time. But then the third is selection. With words, they realize that languages could come to be because as conquerors had a territory and they made a country, then they could, for, for the ease of communication within the country, there was frequently an expectation that you would speak that word. Also more uh, innocently, just neighbors wanted to be able to talk with, with each other. And so you'd have languages that would be shared just so people could talk with each other. This process is selection where essentially some words are rewarded if it helps you to communicate and to either negotiate at the, at the uh, store around the corner or to talk with neighbors or to pay taxes and communicate, Re even when, when the printing press started, to be able to read. Uh, and even before, I mean, obviously books have been around for, for thousands of years. Um, and so as a result, some words are rewarded and move across from pe person to person more, and some are removed and die out of the language uh, over time. And so people, historians and people studying language, uh, even back then, realized that there was this, that all these three things were the main things that were involved, uh, involved rather, in, um, in, in words. And so just to give you an example, and, so, and then we'll start jumping into the answer to, to this uh, answer to the big question, but first just a few more slides. So if you look at foot as an example, in ancient Greek, so it comes, so you could see pods was the root, and ancient Greek, it was pus podos. In Latin, it was pes pedis. Sanskrit, pada, I'm probably totally mispronouncing these things. Russian, pod. Lithuanian, peda. Latvian, peda. Persian, something similar to that root that I cannot pronounce, but it's probably very similar to foot, or rather to pods. Um, and then there was a change over time 
and then another, a, almost a branch form. And this was pronounced instead of pods and related words, it was foot and related words. So in English, it came as foot, German foot, or fus, uh, Gothic fotus, fot, uh, these other languages, foter, Danish foot. Anyway, you see huge similarities that can't be avoided. So it requires an explanation. And so, and so they started making these explanations uh, in terms of understanding that there's a relationships. They understood history at that time because there were still books that were published. And so they realized that they were related and could be organized in different ways to show that more recent countries and more recent cultures had language and words that were different than historical ones. And so Grimm's of the Grimm brothers were actually, they, they didn't actually discover this law. There were other people that did it, but as you'll see in a second, they sort of like just exploited it <laughs> and just put their name on it and called it the Grimm's Law. But in 1822, this is when Grimm's Law was discovered. And Grimm's Law in particular was this idea that there, was, that there were common changes, like even, even so common that you could predict that across different kinds of words, as they progress across cultures, regardless of what the culture is, there will be a, a change from one sound to the next. And this is almost like a, I don't know if it's biological, but there's, but there's a, a really deep underlying structural change in languages that as older languages uh, shift over time, they, that, uh, there's a shift into some of these other sounding words. And so, they, so that was Grimm's Law. And so back then they could already develop one of these family trees in terms of the languages. And as you can see, they thought that English was the best. The one who wrote this, <laughs> this chart was English. So clearly up in the top of right, this, they saw this as the best because we like hierarchies with high on the bet, better is on top and a little worse is on the, on the bottom, which is unfortunate when we're talking about this type of issue because it's, it's kind of silly. Um, but, but English is here. Then you also see German was, and English was a branch, but it also interacted with French and, and, uh, and other languages over here, the Romance languages. And then the branches, you could trace them back in terms of the similarities. And so you could develop an Indo-European root and see how all of these things were related. So this was really interesting. And the point here is that, so Grimm's, let me go on to the next part. So the first point is that they realized that words were evolving, essentially. So this idea was extremely common back then, to the point that grammar school and grammar books that were common around much of the Western world, at least, during this time period that we're, we're talking about, 18, early 1800s, already had this clear idea, it was, it was taught all over that there were these relationships between the languages in terms of how they uh, changed over time and that you could describe them almost as a tree. Then comes, so then we get into Grimm's fairy tales. And so this gets even more interesting. And so what Grimm did, so they, they were, in addition to, to collecting all these stories, they were scholars, and they were really interested in folklore. So all, you might recognize a lot of these tales. So like, I'll just read them out because it's, they, they're responsible for so much of what we know today. So Cinderella, Beauty and the Beast, Hansel and Gretel, Princess and the Frog, Sleeping Beauty, Rapunzel, Rumpelstiltskin, Snow White, Three Little Pigs, Little, Ride, Little Red Riding Hood, and, and lots of others famous, famous stories. What the Grimm brothers did is they collected these oral stories, these oral histories of stories from across Germany and across Europe. And they realized, I mean, based on this discussion, you can almost expect what they realized. They realized that the stories themselves changed over time. And so for instance, you might have a story of Little Red Riding Hood, but it might have changed and in different countries it was slightly different. So maybe in one story of Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf eats the grandma. And then in another story of Little Red Riding Hood, the, it's not a wolf, but it's a pig or some other animal. In another story of Little Red Riding Hood, it's the, the wolf is tamed by Little Red Riding Hood in the, in the woods. And so there's slight variations in the stories themselves. And because the Grimm brothers were interested in collecting these stories, they were uniquely situated to see that it wasn't just words that had this idea of evolution associated with it. They, they didn't use the term back then. Although interestingly enough, the term comes all the way back from Latin uh, in terms of this idea of things rolling out over time in the, in the future. But, but, they, but they realized, the Grimm brothers realized that each of these stories, like so Cinderella, the common version, there is a glass slipper. 
But in other versions, maybe it was a wooden shoe or other types of things that were the key thing. And so, so interesting that these stories all evolved. So, so the key thing here, so the, the brothers were, were Jacob and Willem. They published Grimm's Fairy Tales in 1812, so early 1800s. They were already realizing all this stuff, like prior to even publishing it. They were just in the process of collecting it in the early 1800s. They were already extremely aware of this stuff. And so there are some interesting aspects about fairy tales. One, they make copies because it's, it's told from, from person to person across cultures. It, it's copied over and over again and reproduces almost. There's variation over time because it's, if people tell the story slightly different, they want to put their own little flourish in it. And then there's selection in terms of some folk tales become more popular. So maybe either because the way the story is told is slightly more popular. Uh, for instance, another way of looking at it in modernity, you can see that based on the list, quite a lot of them have been adopted by Disney. And so clearly the Disney versions now have been the ones that were selected as the key one, and that's the one that's replicated the most, and it's been the most successful at this point in terms of our the, the, the specific strain of story or the, the specific details of the story that we all know. And so this is Grimm's Fairy Tales. They already realized this by early 1800s. So then I have something else that's interesting. Here comes Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin, born in 1854, the early 1800s, Oh no, that's that picture was 1854 rather. He was born earlier, uh, 1809, I believe. It'll come back. It'll. I have a slide a little later on. Uh, but but he was born born in the early 1800s. As a kid, he almost certainly would have uh, taken in grammar school. He would have read his grammar books, and it would have shown him something or described the word's origin as being related like this. When Grimm's Law came about, it was big news. It was something that academics would be talking about. That the Grimm's Law, wow, we have this relationship that we understand this relationship with words. And at, at this point, when, when the, this was unique. So when the Grimm brothers identified this law, it almost made studying language into a science. So that we call it linguistics or philology. And so it was really a, a, a quantitative, mathematical almost uh, understanding of the of this evolution of language and so at this point charles darwin comes into the story and so his uh his contribution was he was he would have looked at or understood that there was this sort of like a language tree so his contribution was to say oh well you know why don't we make it could could it be possible that there is a species tree so somehow relating animals plants and other species altogether. That was this big insight of evolution that we're talking about when we talk about Darwin's story of evolution based on natural selection. And so you could, and so one thing that, that, um, that everyone who works on trees now is, understands, whether it's a, not, not trees outside, but these kind of, uh, of phylo trees, whether it's a phylogenetic tree like we're looking at here, or a philology tree, which you're talking about this tree of language, um, so, so these, right now it puts, see, you can see here in this picture, human is like right in the center and the top. And so it's sort of like a hierarchy that it's developed as. One of the other key understandings from, from among people who study the evolution of things is that really it doesn't make any sense to say what's most recent is at the height. Is at the height. So usually what, what you'll see now in trees is that you turn it on its side. And so the things that are on the right are just the more recent ones. And the thing, and so the things that are on the left are just earlier in time. And so then you can see the relationship between time, uh, things over time. Um, and so anyway, so here, so here you see people and primates, and you see that bats are not too, too, too different. And so that's why we have a lot of, uh, of um, genes and a lot of uh, phenotypes even that are related. So we have a lot of receptors that are very similar and a lot of things that are very related. And so when we talk about things jumping, from species to species, it's because of evolution that we have these same receptors, that they're the exact same receptors in many cases, because they've just retained over time in these branches as, this, as the species have split over time. And so let me tell you something very interesting about this. It's, this question is that all of these things rep represent evolution, and evolution has three things in common. And so another way of saying this is, Anywhere, whenever you see anything that makes copies, 
where in the copies there's variation over time and that there's something that selects it. So whether it's natural selection or cultural selection or something else going on, something that makes some of the mutants or the, var or the variations uh, replicate more than others or some others die out faster than others. Anytime you have this, then there will be an evolution and a change over time. And so this, occur, uh, this is the same case no matter what you're looking at. So now I'll get into a little bit more detail. Well, first, let me just show this because it's just really interesting in terms of the timeline, just to bring this all together. So what we have here, so 1786, this is when the Indo-European term was coined by William Jones. Charles Darwin was born in 1809. Grimm's fairy tales were published by 1812. Could have been very likely that, he, that uh, as a young boy, Charles Darwin even read Grimm's fairy tales. Grimm's Law was published in 1822 when Charles Darwin turned 13. And then The Origin of Species was published in 1859. So it's just really interesting to see how the, the uh, idea of evolution itself evolved over time or, or developed over time. Um, some other things that were just interesting just in terms of looking at this idea of evolution, just for if you're, as a side note, if you're interested. So the protein was discovered all the way back in 1838. These timelines don't overlap uh, very well. But protein was discovered in 1838 well before The Origin of Species was published. Uh, John Snow, a uh, famous public health figure I might have re uh, referenced in previous weeks, uh, his, when he solved the cholera pandemic and ended the cholera pandemic because of this intervention of going to the local well and taking the pump off of it so people could no longer take water from that well, um, that was 1854. 1866, Gregor Mendel, uh, publishes Mendelian genetics. He, he didn't call it genetics at the time. At that time, it was called factors. Uh, but his idea of looking at the genes uh, in, in uh, we didn't call it genes, but, but we, what we now know as genes, um, how they uh, have relationships, that there's homozygous, heterozygous, things that you would have learned uh, in high school. Then in 1869, so this would have been a decade after the or On the Origin of Species was published. And when On the Origin of Species was published, it was revolutionary for the scientific world globally because it tied all of these other things to science for science together. It gave things a structure that allowed us to understand how things fit together. And so in 1869, when things then became discovered ever after 1859, everyone tried to fit in their discoveries back to the origin of species. Oh, this explains, this explains this part of the origin of species, or this explains this other part of the origin of species. And so for instance, in 1869, pro, when the protein was discovered, and now it's called protein, but back then it came from ancient Greek, and the discoverers thought it was, they called it protein, because in ancient Greek it meant the first rank molecule. And so it was like the, the, the most important, the highest rank one. And they thought that this was the, was the, uh, ex, was the, the explanatory molecule for all of life. And then this nuclein was identified in, 19, in 1869, and they thought, oh, wow, it was found in the nucleus, because you could see that in a, in a microscope at the time. And so they found the chemical inside and called it this nuclein. Um, in, but then a lot of decades passed. And it wasn't until 1944 that people realized, and they put two and two together, that this idea of Gregor Mendel's genes were related to nucleic acids. And that was this, this really historical study. And then, but then shortly after, so this guy, Erwin Chargoff, realized, well, wait a second. As soon as the study was published, it was even famous in 1944. As soon as it was published, Erwin Ir Chargoff realized, whoa, if, this, if, if it's true that nucleic acids are the, the things that make up the genes, then this is almost the, the Bible of genes that we could, if we understood nucleic acids, then we could understand the whole language of genetics and as, as things are evolving in terms of what that looks like and across species, across history. And so he proved that DNA varied across species, but he didn't know the language yet, but he was able to prove that DNA varied. And so then it wasn't in 1953 that this question of evolution was fully punctuated and answered where that gave us the model of, of um, a double helix for DNA that was uh, discovered by Watson and Crick. Uh, some other people have been working on it too. And, um, and this brought everything together. And I've spent quite a lot of time talking about it, but it's just such an interesting topic. Uh, and so I'll, I'll move on to, to why it becomes more important for us. All right, 
So there are some interesting aspects about viruses. Viruses make copies, they spread, they have offspring, they, they vary, they mutate over time because each time they, they make a copy, there's a possibility that there's going to be a different uh, change over time, either a natural variation. Sometimes people call them mistakes, but it's kind of silly to call it a mistake. I mean, but it's the same idea in the, in the sense that there's just variation over time. Um, and then the third thing is selection. So some viruses are selective. So here you go. So this past week, there was a big article that was published uh, in, the, so in recent days, let's say. Um, and you might have seen it in the lay press that viruses mutate. And so some a group of researchers studying this question have concluded in the, in the press that a mutant coronavirus has emerged even more contagious than the original. And so they said, wow, we're seeing that the majority at this point of SARS-CoV-2 actually is this new version of the mutation that was not the original version of the, of the, uh, uh, version of the virus. It not, was not the one that originally hit in the United States. And, but this conclusion, the problem is that we don't know based on the data that they had. And, and the study was interesting because they did some really interesting analytics, but the conclusion was wrong. And the, their conclusion was that because there were a lot of copies, because there were a lot of copies and there was a variation, they assumed that it had evolved and that it was spreading more because you had one version of the copy, one copy had, more, had, a, had something that made it spread more versus others. And they assumed that there would have been selection because the way that selection works in viruses, there's a couple ways that it works, but one of the ways that it works is that viruses that, we, we talked about this R value previously. So the R value is the average number of people that get infected if from a previously infected person. So if, someone, if one person's infected, if they infect three other people, then that R value is three. If there were a mutation that made the R value five, then over weeks and months, because that infected on, on average five times versus the other one infecting three times, you'd expect way more spread, way more replication. So that would be a reason that, you'd, that would explain that virus was mutating and would become more contagious or more uh, was spreading more. The question of deadly would also be the same type of thing. That wouldn't be explained by selection because that's the, it wouldn't impact the replication. In fact, just the opposite. One thing we find generally about viruses across the universe of species that have been studied is that typically viruses become less more, uh, they, they produce less death over time because the purpose of the virus, we can say, we can interpret it if you put ourselves in the virus's head, if you can, if you were, um, that the viruses, if, they're, if their goal is to reproduce, then if they kill off their hosts too quick, then they die out. That version of the, the, the mutant that causes them to kill the host would die out. And the ones that were less uh, virulent and were, and were less likely to kill the host would then survive and have more copies over time. And so you'd expect uh, to evolution to sort of make viruses less uh, uh, deadly over time. But so here, when we go back to SARS-CoV-2, there are some interesting things that we need to understand of why it was probably not selection. So the key thing to remember is that as all of this replication was going on, we were under lockdown in much of the country. And so for instance, among New York City, where there was much less travel going on outside of the city on airplanes, let's say, but even at that point, still people were going on the subway and still going to the, to the supermarket, and we're, we're still doing, uh, but still going locally into the office, um, there would have been replication that could have had the exact same R value. So it was no more contagious than anything else, but it just happened to be spreading because of where they were. That New York City, you're just exposed to more people on the subway, and so it just has a bigger opportunity to spread. And it has nothing to do with the, any mutation that might have gone on or the viral genotype, but instead it's just an artifact of the geography, of people just spreading it because there's a lot more people involved. The other thing is that you see over time that this orange one was this first one in Washington state. Over time, the blue one became more common, but an interesting thing that, with, that people started realizing was that when, and when you look at the lockdown, 
it wasn't actually the case that these that the curves were going at very different rates the curves were very similar they might look slightly different but they were it's very similar it's not like the blue started like having a long tail relative to the orange and it's not like the blue dropped more quickly or that the orange dropped more quickly they, the t curves of the tail look extremely similar if you were to follow it through and it's just that the volume of patients is more but the curves themselves are no different and if it was more contagious you would have expected that the curves would have been different so right now there's no evidence that there's anything more contagious you don't have to worry right now there might be some some uh, uh, difference that if among all the antibodies or rather the vaccines that are being developed that if a vaccine is too closely linked to a specific type of viral genotype, that maybe there would be something, or viral phenotype, that maybe there it might be slightly less effective. But at this case, but in this case, there has not been an enormous amount of change. And even more, we've identified some areas with the virus that seem to be highly resistant to changing. And so now that's good because it enables us to focus our our vaccines on those specific parts of the virus that are less likely to change. So we won't have to have an annual vaccine like we do for the flu. So it, this is a good thing, actually. Um, the one other thing that, that can show, that, can, that this can inform us about is um, the viral load. So if it were more contagious or, or, or specifically not necessarily more contagious, but more, um, like cause more fatality or cause more severe illness, then you would expect that there would be a big difference in viral load and other aspects. And again, we're not seeing major differences in the viral load or that kind of stuff. Um, there might be some, uh, some shift that might be seen, but nothing is statistically significant. And so, so you can see that might, there might be some variation, but at the same time, it's, it's nothing. Right now, there's, there's, there, it, we could easily say there is no evidence to support the hypothesis that, this, uh, that, that any different strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus are either more contagious or cause more severe disease or more uh, or more deadly. So um, that answers that. First Hopefully, of all, thank you for helping put this in context. I think I'm gonna take a break from reading Grimm's fairy tales at bedtime for a little while until this is all over because it will be very difficult for me to separate the two concepts in my mind. But the, that was really very, very helpful. In it's fascinating, isn't it? It's, I think it's truly fascinating. I, I agree with you. And, and, and the, the, the etymology was very interesting with the language development, so very helpful. We have a question, Rachel Scherzer is asking, um, in, in these different strains, is it possible that somebody could become infected with one strain and then become, become reinfected with another strain? Um, to kind of build upon that, you know, we're hearing about people as they're recovering from these infections, they go through sort of different waves. They get better and then they get worse again and then they get better. Is that perhaps related to maybe picking up a different strain, or is that just the way that this the virus kind of moves through one system? Yeah, so it's unlikely based on a new virus yet. Um, as, as So over the last couple of weeks, there have been more publications, more studies looking at this, and some more publications have come out of it. And right now, it seems like the vast majority of the um, reinfections or re-emergence or reactivation that people have been talking about um, that the vast majority are actually due to false positives or false negatives in the tests themselves rather than the person. So for instance, um, the, it could be a false negative where they never actually got cured and, uh, and, they, um, and so they got a false negative test and so it made it seem like they had recovered and cleared the virus, but really it was a false negative. Or they did truly clear the virus but then they had a false positive test that make it seem like they were reactivated. And so the vast majority now seem like it's the, it's the test itself that has been at fault. Um, so right now there's not yet any evidence published that there has actually been a reactivation where the virus literally goes, hides out in one part of the body like we see for HIV or some other uh, retroviruses groups. Um, but, um, but, and so, so right now that's good news. Um, but so, but there's still uncertainty where I don't know for sure. Um, and so that's still something that we're trying to figure out, but, but it, it's good news uh, that it doesn't seem like of all the cases we've been hearing of reactivation, uh, at least the vast majority of them are not due to, it seems, reinfection or 
virus hiding or something. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that, Glenn. We also got a question about this slide, slide 90. Could you please dig a little deeper and explain this a little bit further, what you're showing here? Oh, oh sure. <laughs> yep. I, so I don't know that I actually can dig much deeper. Uh, this was a geneticist who uh, had posted something to one of the um, uh, my academic uh, uh, listservs that I'm part of, or I guess they're not listservs, just a, a group that I'm part of uh, just for my doctoral program and from other, other activities that I'm involved in. Um, and so basically what we're looking at here is the number of PCR cycles. So PCR, if you recall from previous weeks, uh, polymerase chain reaction, the way that we identify if a virus is there, because remember these viral counts are very, very, very small. And so the way that it works is you take a sample, you try to ampli amplify it, and it takes a long time to amplify it. And so you amplify it once, you amplify it twice, you amplify it 10 times, 20 times. And what they did here is they showed the viral count at different levels of amplification. So typically for your test, you would maybe have a standard number of cycles that you would, rep, uh, that you would try to amplify it. And what they showed here is that this bar on the right with the blue, which was the new mutation, what they're calling the G614, this had a higher viral load because you could tell it because it required less re uh, number of numbers of amplifications and that less PCR cycles in order to get um, a, a certain number of counts that you could find. Whereas the old version seemed to have a greater number. So both in terms of the, the width that you're talking about, the numbers, as well as the, in terms of the cycles that you're looking at, in, in terms of the additional proportion, let's say, that we're identifying. But, when you look, the, a key thing, and this has come up again and again over the weeks, I can go into it again if you want, but I prefer maybe in a, a different week to, to uh, jump into that because we've already been talking about uh, some other things and there's some other interesting things to talk about this week. But basically this idea of, well, I, okay, I'll get into this just for a second because it's also really interesting. So this is the uh, confidence interval around where this bar is of what's most likely. And we know that when, what we're trying to do is take samples from a study and then extrapolate to what the population, so the universe of this mutant is around the country. And so because of that, there's always going to be an error. Does the study represent what's truly going on? Does the sample represent what's truly going on in the population? This is the same concept that we have in every scientific study. Whether you're looking at a clinical trial that was reported for a treatment, whether you're looking at a estimation of a population size, so for instance, where that came up was the um, prevalence rate of antibodies in the population. And again, here, when you're looking at the um, estimating from a sample, looking at the universe to try to understand what, whether there's a real difference here or whether it might've just been something about the samples that they had pulled. And so here you see this overlap and the overlap means that this study did, even though there was some slight variation in the study, it could have easily fallen anywhere within this box. And because there's an overlap, it means that you can't conclude from the study what the authors concluded that, um, that there was a difference between them. Uh, there, there might be at some point, we, further studies might be done and might find something, but this study does not provide uh, evidence that that's the case. I'll tell you, so we've been talking about language again. Uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll just mention one other story. Um, the 95% confidence interval. Everyone's heard about it, whether you're in science or not. Where does this come from? Why is there such a thing as a 95% confidence interval? And so it all came from this guy, Ronald Fisher. So Ronald, like Donald Ronald, Ronald Fisher, who lived at the turn of the previous century, so early 1900s. Um, he was a very famous statistician, really smart guy, um, but kind of a jerk. <laughs> but so, but first I'll tell you why he was such a smart guy. So basically, Anyone who's taken even like a first year college course, even high school, in statistics would have heard of analysis of variance, maybe the F test, um, other kinds of things. That was all him. That was Ronald Fisher. He, he was highly influential in the field of statistics. Um, he, but also, in addition, you can't talk about Ronald Fisher without, without talking about this. He was also the chair of the eugenics department at the university in which he taught. And at the time, public health and statistics were merged in eugenics departments. That's where it was housed. 
And it was this idea that, oh, well, by selection, you could remove parts of the population that you thought were not good, and then you could put in parts of the population that, or, or promote parts of the population that you thought were good to have a better society over time. And this appalling idea of, eugen of, of, um, of, of eugenics um, was hor horrendous. And so it took years, I mean, including like overcoming the Holocaust in World War II for it to finally sink in that no, that's actually not a good idea. Um, although interestingly, um, it still existed in the United States, this idea of eugenics, where people were pri given priority for abortions and other things or for, um, um, uh, not, for, for not getting pregnant in the first place based on aspects of who they might be. Uh, in terms of maybe people who had uh, psychiatric illness and other kinds of things. It persisted well after the Holocaust in the United States and other countries, which is surprising. Anyway, coming back to the 95% confidence interval, so this guy who was both brilliant, highly respected at the time, but also a jerk, um, <laughs> so he decided, well, if we know that you can't be sure about a study and you're trying to understand the population, how can we be sure? What level of confidence should we use? And so he said, well, if I were 95% confident that this were the case, then I would be, that would be good, good enough for me. And I would, and I would use that. And I would, I, I would say, okay, the study is sufficient evidence for me to say that at the population level, uh, it's a true, real thing that we're seeing. The problem was, so, and so this was good. The problem was then the very next scientist who published said, okay, well, what level of evidence do I think is important? And, he, and they looked around and they said, uh-oh, Fisher just said that 95% uh, confident was the, was the way we should go. Who am I compared to this guy to think it should be something else? Like maybe I would use 90% or 99%, but Fisher just said 95%, so I'm gonna use 95% too. Over years and over all the decades, anytime anyone wanted to use a different number, 90%, anything else, everyone else would say, well, what's your reason for using a number than what everyone else has been using at this point? And there's no good reason. So everyone else just continues using 95% as the cutoff. And there's lots of problems that come, come associated with that now that we found. And so now we tend to look more at questions of precision and reliability and these other things that I won't get into right now. But this question, this 95% confidence interval itself has a really interesting story behind it. So I just put it out there for you. So. I'm enjoying your history lessons and your science okay. and, you, and um, making me think back but to, to uh, Statistics 101 is not a good place where I want to <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I certainly enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm glad one of us did. <laughs> um, to switch gears just a little, what do you think, Len? Can we talk about the curve, flattening the curve? Can we talk about states reopening what do you think should we should we go there i know yes i'm seeing some nodding you know we've been talking about this curve and flattening this curve for a long time i don't know where everybody is located but i know a number of us are here in new jersey and we're watching what's going on in other states around the country that are starting to open with partially or to a different degrees Talk to us, tell us, please, how will we know when we should reopen? And have we been successful? And how do we define success in flattening this curve? You've talked about getting tracing ramped up, tracking all of those other systems. Where are we? And maybe okay. focus in on New Jersey, unless there's anyone on today's discussion who would like to talk about another state feel free to, to chime in. All right, so let me start with what the curve looks like. Um, so we aren't actually, so, so there's two things here. You can see that the curve is flattening up here. So we started with this exponential curve and then it started going down and now it's just like bumping up and down a little bit, but it seems like it's flattening. The problem is this is the United States is lots of states all in one country. If you were to add up the entire population of the US, it's roughly the same as the population of all of the countries of Europe combined into one country. And so, at the, at, so some states are going up and some states are going down. In New York City, 
we're, we're and, and the New York City metro area, including New Jersey, Connecticut, our, our curves look like the light blue curve here. So we are going down, we're going in the right direction. The lockdown has been effective. We are on our way back to a very, very, very low number within weeks uh, based on the current trajectory of the curve. Um, and so that means that reopening should be, could, could easily be happening in weeks. Um, again, the goal, the whole point of locking it down, there's two points. One is that we wouldn't want the curve to get so high that it overwhelms all of our healthcare facilities. And then uh, that would be way bad because then you'd have to send people home to die. And that would be terrible without, without any treatment at all. And so, but, and so that was one of the first reasons. But then the second reason now to continue to lock down is to reset the clock. The goal is to make it so that if we can get down to just a few cases happening every day, then that's enough when, for when we set up test and trace that we can get a handle on it. So if you get 1,000, 10,000 people, even around the country, 100,000 plus people working on this, then there's, that's en enough that this number of cases should be small enough that you can then go and identify each of the people that are infected, their families, their friends, everyone they might have get, gotten in contact with for the past two days. Um, and so that's our goal here. Once we get to the curve being very, very low, then logistically it becomes much easier to contact trace, to test. We'll have enough tests, hopefully, and in terms of the ramp up of all the tests being available, but then also in terms of the, um, the logistical capacity to actually test the people and then trace everyone going on. That, that's, the, that's the plan, that's what we're going for here. The problem is when you look at the United States, after removing the three major outbreaks, which have been in New York City, and then to a lesser extent, but still there in Detroit and New Orleans, you see that the infection rate is actually going back up again. It's going in the wrong direction. So what this means is that there are now new outbreaks that are happening around the country in multiple places, and they're starting to be opened up, and they are not thinking about the consequences, that they will not have logistical capacity to find these cases, to test them, and to trace them. Um, so going into more detail about this, the New York Times put together a really interesting piece. Um, so we've talked about some of the criteria of what would be necessary. I don't know if you can see the screen very well, but so they put together a series of these um, criteria that people are talking about. So the number of daily new cases should not be going up. They should be going down for a period of time before a state opens. And blue are the states that have begun to reopen or plan to reopen soon. And you can see that among a lot of the blues that are planning to reopen soon, the very ones that did the poorest job of getting it under control where it's still increasing, those are the same ones that are opening sooner. Like, so they're, they're making the exact wrong choice. Um, like even some on the East Coast, Maine, New Hampshire, the number of new cases are rising there. This is not a time, because what, clearly what's going on is that they are not setting them up for, themselves up for success to have logistical, uh, for, to have the logistics in place to do contact test, tracing and testing. And so what we're gonna see is that they will not be able to bring the R number down. The, when you have contact tracing, then you can protect, uh, prevent the, the curve that we just saw earlier, because for each new case, you get them or get the person they might have infected and then trace it back and identify everyone. And you can very, it's very, very effective you, at, at reducing the, number, the amount of spread. You don't even have to be 100% effective. If the R value is three, then all you have to be is two thirds effective or let's say 70% effective. You can miss 30% of the cases and still be effective at getting the R value below one. And then as I'll show you in a second, as, as soon as you get the R value pet below one, then it just dies out on its own. And so it's amazing, this idea of people, people have to intuitively get this idea that even without any treatments, without any vaccine, without any of that stuff, we can eliminate this virus just by test and trace, just getting the R value less than one. And so these, people, these blue states, some of them are gonna be okay, but a lot of them are really in deep trouble and we're just gonna see more, more outbreaks. So I'll, in fact, I'll just flip through some of the metrics. So the number of daily new cases looks like that. Um, the daily share of tests that are positive, you see not going down in a lot of cases, in some cases, in some states going up. Um, some of these, this, the dashed line is 
the line at which 10% of the tests are positive. So states need to be below 10% in order to reopen. Like it should be start getting way lower than 10% are positive in order for to have the logistical capacity to address this using test and trace. And you see that almost all of these blue states that are talking about reopening, their number of of positive tests are above that line. So it, this country is really not seeing the end of this. We're, we're gonna see this for a lot longer. At least you see, if you can see the gray, New York, New Jersey, the, the trend is going down. In all these gray, that we, we're getting our act together. We realize that we still have positive tests, that there's too many, and so that's why we're gray. We're being smart about it, and we're waiting until the levels go below this dotted line. The next thing that I'll point out. So the dashed line here represents the recommended number of tests, uh, the, num the, the level of tests that are out there. The past one was the percentage that were positive. This one is just the sheer number, the volume of tests that are available. And so you see that to this day, in no place are there sufficient tests for us to launch, uh, except with the exception of, uh, what is this, Rhode Island? Rhode Island clearly has a lot of tests, but they have other bad things going for them, so they should not be, oh, Looks North North Dakota looks like they they passed it too, um, but um, but in almost all cases, there we we they wouldn't even know. A lot of these blue states wouldn't even know if they had something bad going on because they don't have enough tests to even test the population to even know. So so test and trace is not going to work if you don't have the tests. And then finally, in this one, um, these these are just another view of states that are opening soon. Um, and there's, there, this country is not out of the woods. Some states have it more under control. New Jersey, New York, obviously, it's not completely under control, but we're going in the right direction, and, and, we're, and lockdown is still necessary. And you can, you can extrapolate out if you wanted to, just based on the curve that you see. It's pretty consistent for when you go within a state. But that's, that's just what it is that we're looking at. Um, the problem is going to be traveling. So once New York and New Jersey and these other Arab states finally get down below a certain level and we can contact trace, what are we going to do when there's outbreaks in all of these other states that have reopened too early? Because when they reopen, there's nothing stopping the virus. And so whatever the R value was, let's say it was three, then it will just start spreading again at, level, at an R equals three. Maybe there will be a little bit of reduction because people will be a little bit more cautious. Maybe they'll be wearing masks. But that stuff alone is not going to get R below one. And so there will be more patients. And what do you do? And, and, and also the, the, the ones with no symptoms at all, the asymptomatic folks, what are you going to do if someone from Pennsylvania decides to just cross over the border to go out to eat in the restaurants in New Jersey because they can? They like the restaurants better in New Jersey. Or New Hampshire decides to go to Connecticut. Um, these are, this is, this is not something that's going away anytime soon. Even when our states open in New Jersey and New York, this outbreak has just begun in a lot of these other states now because there will not be enough contact tracing. And testing. These, these graphs are really helpful, Glenn, in showing us what's happening around the country. How soon will we be able to see an analysis of kind of comparing state by state? Obviously, we understand that, like you said, people can move outside of their states, but in next week's session or the session after that, would we be able to kind of compare then where we are then against where we are today and be able to kind of extrapolate based on that data what we can see here? Or is it just there's just too many variables that they're not the states are, tra are tracking and tracing at different levels? Is it, will, we, will it be useful to us here? Um, so we will see changes over time in the states just because i mean you can see when at the at the highest level at the country level in the united states you can see that there's already we're seeing it, an, an increase over time so that's so there will be changes over time in terms of forecasting what that looks like i don't know i mean state by states some states are going to have to lock down again um their outbreaks are going to get too high their hospitals are going to start to overflow and, and there won't be any way to, to stop it without locking down. Um, there's clearly variation among politicians' willingness to let people die and to uh, just think in terms of their philosophy. 
of letting it just burn through the population for the sake of the economy or, or whatever else they're talking about. Um, one thing they don't realize is that if people are not comfortable with this, their safety, they're not going to go out to buy things because transactions, a lot of transactions are based on face-to-face -face transactions. And if people are, don't feel safe, they're not going out to buy stuff and they're not going to exchange goods and services. And um, the economy is not going to increase suddenly with just because you decide not to lock down if the people are still getting sick. And so um, there's going to be wide variation across the country. Um, so the predictors that you can know in terms of the, the ones who are getting hit the hardest. So this, this is not a question of how contagious it is. That's the R value issue. This is a question of how severe it is, how, what's the fatality rate. Um, we do know that some people are more likely to get, um, to get s severely sick from it. I had a previous slide. Let me see if I can find it real quickly. Um, so one thing I had shown earlier, yeah, that was a more recent slide. Um, so one thing that we've seen is that minorities um, sometimes are more likely to get sick, either to get exposed or get sick if they are exposed or get uh, or, or uh, die than than people who are who are, um, who are white or other types of minorities. Um, and so this puts people at higher risk. Part of it is access to care. There might be socioeconomic components here. So some parts of the country in which there's less access to care could be an indicator, and that varies a lot state to state. The other things for sure that we've been talking about are age, where older people are much more likely to get sick and much more likely to die. That varies a lot by state. Um, there's a lot of these factors. Another thing that's interesting that hasn't been talked about as much in the news, but that seems to be an important factor and might be one of the reasons that New York City got hit so hard is what's called the inoculation dose. So when someone's first infected with the virus, they could be infected with a little amount or a lot amount. Um, people who get infected just in passing, say someone from the office who they might have just interacted with for just a few minutes and they just barely passed the threshold to get infected. Those people typically, on average, have less severe cases than other people who get a lot more when they're first infected. So what's an example of someone who gets a lot more when they're first infected? Someone who gets infected by a family member or a housemate when they're living in the same family and they get in contact every hour and at meal times and going to the bathroom using the same bathroom. That infection accumulates and actually puts them more at risk. Um, and so this inoculation dose is a, is a real issue. Other ways that people could have an inoculation dose that's high is if someone is working together and they're together, close together for much of the day and they have a lot of hours of exposure, or if they are um, taking the subway, standing very close to each other for 20 minutes, uh, that might not be a lot of time, but if they're extremely close together for that 20 minutes, then that could be a higher inoculation dose. Um, but that's something else. There's, the, the, there's, a, there's these three, again, the, the um, race component, the age component, and the, the dose of inoculation right now seem to be the three biggest ones. There are some other ones as well, but um, these are the, inter if I were to predict at the state levels, I would look at these variations uh, as explanatory. Thanks, Glenn. So I think we have time for, for one more question and um, maybe we can save some of, some of these other questions for next week or another session. Some of these other questions just wanted to share with everybody were, have you seen the movie Plandemic online? What are your thoughts? Um, another question was, could the Wuhan lab have released the virus to the public and started this whole pandemic even by accident? So these are some things we can talk about in the future. Oh, wait, I, let, me, let me talk about them today. I can talk about them more, but this is perfect based on the discussion we've already had. Unless right, you have- Which one? Choose one and we'll save one for next week. Well, so here's and an which interesting- one Pandemic or the Wuhan lab? Well, guess what? Based on our discussion, here are some interesting aspects about memes. Memes are just like other types of information, like language, like the folklore, like cultural transmission, like genes. Memes have these three same criteria. 
they make copies and they spread over online and, and through different uh, medium. They vary over time. So for instance, a lot of people are making memes. Maybe they slightly alter them. Some are better at spreading than others are. And so you might've seen some, then they die out, then others are more are persisting in terms of how much they spread. These are copies and these are variation. And then there's selection. And what happens with memes in terms of selection is that they trigger us and they make us emotionally satisfied as a story to explain things. And we like as people like to feel like we really understand stuff. And so memes, if, some, if we feel that something is really explaining a hidden truth or, or explaining something about the universe that we didn't understand, then it triggers us emotionally rather than logically. And so it replicates for, further. We send it to our friends, we send it to our family, make copies, and then that replicates. And those, the ones that are the most successful to spread are the ones that have been the variations that hit just the sweet spot. And the sweet spot gets sweeter and sweeter over time. Like the Russians are hard at work here. They're trying to make this, these memes as going viral as much as possible. And so they started out okay. They've been trying using trial and error. They've been developing over time differently. And so now what we have here are not just pandemic and not just Wuhan, but there's lots of different memes that have been going around and they've all started to hit more of a sweet spot in our thinking. And it's all very similar. I can go more into detail about these specific questions in the future, uh, maybe next week. Uh, I mean, I don't want to go too much into details because it's all crap. It's all well, silly. Okay, so I but... guess for today, do you recommend that we watch this pandemic movie or not? No, no. It's a virus. Unless you want to infect your brain with a virus, viral <laughs> meat. Don't do it. It's, uh, okay. We can talk about why it's wrong in the future, but really it's made not to provide a logical argument that is logical to explain facts. It's making an argument that's emotional to make you want to believe something, that there's a conspiracy going on and that the conspiracy explains. And here's, here's why this coronavirus existed now and it never existed before. They leave out these critical things like this is the second SARS, it's not just a coronavirus, there's lots of other coronaviruses circulating. The, uh, much of the common cold is caused by coronaviruses. But this is not just the first coronavirus, this is the second SARS coronavirus, the type of coronavirus that causes SARS, the second since 2002. And so, I mean, you can, we can start going into the weeds, but do not watch it unless you just really like being misled <laughs> by people who are out to get you. These are, this, these are very polished, things that are being put out now. Like it's not just a little idea that's spreading. People are spending a lot of money to polish these movies and polish these memes to make them seem more real. When in reality, all they're doing is, is replicating and trying to trigger us so that we spread it and we send it to other people because we're so convinced by it emotionally. Don't waste your time. Don't, don't get emotionally entangled. Thanks for putting that into perspective for us. That's actually really very helpful. Okay, so more to come on that next week. And maybe we can wrap up today with uh, one, one last question. Deborah Weisletter has a question about, we're starting to hear this week about children for the first time and the rise, and, and it's a very small percentage of the infections, but then the, the separate infections that these children are having and maybe you can talk a little bit about that this week and then kind of add on to that next week as we see more how this is developing. Yeah, so I don't have a lot of information about this. Um, there's been a lot, a lot more, um, there have been more publications looking at children in particular, of course. And so things that we've found over time are that at first we thought that maybe children couldn't even get infected at all definitely the severity is much less. That was even from the very beginning in terms of studies being published coming out of China. Um, and so that right now what we know is that yes, children can be infected. Yes, children can spread the virus um, and for a variety of reasons. It definitely is replicating in children. Um, we do know for sure that children are extremely much, much, much less likely to have severe symptoms or severe consequences of the disease. Um, and so those are things that we know for sure so far. Um, in, terms, in terms of 
rare, pardon me, rare things that are coming up. Um, there are more rare uh, sequelae that are being identified. So more rare uh, diseases, more symptoms coming out of it. We do know that SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 produces systemic illness in people. So it means that it's not just a lung disease, it's, a, it's an inflammatory disease that infects much of the body or, or impacts much of the body. And whenever you have an inflammatory disease that impacts much of the body, they can trigger all sorts of other things. Um, and so we do know that, we do know that it's rare. Um, in terms of trying to get a better understanding of what's going on, what are the predictors, uh, there's still a lot of unknowns, but I haven't dug into it enough to really be able to say anything more than that right now. But for next week, for next week, I'll dig into it a little bit more. All right, we'll give you one week and then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll only be able to discuss what's been published and what the sum of knowledge that we have at that point. You know this is an ongoing thing. Two months seems like five years for us because it seems like it's been so long, but we have to remember that two months is still only two months. It's, it's really not a long time for science to, to really get its head around or its heads around uh, different areas. That's a really good point. And so Glenn, I, I speak on behalf of the entire audience. We really enjoyed our session with you today. Thank you for all of the research that you've done. Thank you for, for the history lesson on Grimm's, the Grimm brothers and beyond. And um, as always, if you have questions or you, you, um, your friends, your loved ones have questions, please send them to me or to Glenn during the week so we can try to incorporate them into next week's session. But um, for today, just wanna say thank you for being here. Everyone continue to stay happy and healthy and Glenn, can we assume we'll see you back here next Sunday at three o'clock? Yes, sounds great. Wonderful. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Beck. Everybody. And Becky, can you stay on for, for a few more minutes? I can. Great.